mephestoprone, however you pronounce the word. That is how Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito apparently pronounced the name of the abortion medication mifepristone. I'll say it again, mifepristone. Alito was speaking in an extended interview with The Wall Street Journal and explained that he was annoyed that he had to stop doing what he was doing to decide whether this drug, mifepristone, or however you pronounce the word, would stay legal while the case worked its way through our judicial system. Quote, Justice Alito finds these applications a nuisance. So sorry to interrupt your workflow, Justice Alito. It's just a decision about whether or not millions of people with uteruses across the country can access the most commonly used method of abortion. But sorry for bothering you. Now, we got that little peek behind the curtain because for some reason, Justice Alito thought it was time to speak to the press. The headline of his newly published interview in The Wall Street Journal is, This Made Us Targets of Assassination, which is definitely some kind of headline. It refers to threats Justice Alito says were caused by the leak of his own decision in the Dobbs case, the one that overturned Roe v. Wade. And to be crystal clear here, physical threats against anyone are reprehensible. But the bulk of this interview is not actually about that. The bulk of this interview is Justice Alito describing his outrage that anyone is criticizing the court at all. Quote, this type of concerted attack on the court and on individual justices is new during my lifetime. We are being hammered daily, and I think quite unfairly in a lot of instances. And nobody, practically nobody, is defending us. Alito says this kind of criticism undermines confidence in the government. The Wall Street Journal says his interview took place on April 13th. And just that day, April 13th, ProPublica advanced its already extensive reporting on Justice Clarence Thomas and his ethics scandals, reporting that Thomas sold a house to a conservative billionaire while Thomas was on the court, and Thomas did not disclose the sale. And despite the fact that her son no longer owns it, Thomas's mother still lives in that house. When the Wall Street Journal asked Alito about Thomas's scandals, though, Alito's only reply was, I'll stay away from that. Yeah, why would anyone in their right mind criticize the court? Anyway, since then, in just two weeks, we have gotten the news that just days after being confirmed to the Supreme Court, Justice Neil Gorsuch sold property to the head of a major law firm that frequently has business before the court, and Gorsuch didn't disclose who he sold that property to. And just today, we learned that a whistleblower claims that Chief Justice John Roberts' wife who recruits lawyers for elite law firms, has made at least $10 million in commissions while her husband has been on the court. Quote, at least one of those firms argued a case before Chief Justice Roberts after paying his wife hundreds of thousands of dollars. So Justice Alito's assertion that it's the media criticism of the court that's undermining trust in the institution is very much up for debate. Joining us now is Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent at Vox, where he focuses on the Supreme Court. He is also the author of The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. Ian, thank you for joining me. I know you have thoughts on this. What do you think of Justice Alito's assertion that the court is being treated particularly unfairly? Oh, my God. I, I mean, what country does he think he lives in? Because this is the United States. And here in the United States, we criticize our leaders. That is something that is actually called the First Amendment that allows us to criticize our leaders. And Alito is a justice of the Supreme Court. So he's supposed to be one of the guardians of our Constitution. And if he doesn't get that as a powerful public official, we get to criticize him, Dude's in the wrong line of work. Yeah, you know, even Antonin Scalia understood that people who were critics should have to do so publicly and not be afraid of the, the blowback, if you will, right? We know this from correspondence between, or I think even rulings between him and Thomas, right? Thomas is all for secrecy, and Scalia was like, this is the home of the brave, stand up for what you believe in. The idea that the court should somehow be shrouded in a packed in bubble wrap particularly at this time when they're issuing some of the most controversial rulings of my lifetime, I think it's flabbergasted. The sense of grievance that was on display in this article was really uh, uh, stunning, in, in, to my mind. 
Yeah, it, it was astonishing. I mean, does he not have an aide who can tell them, like, hey, dude, you, you have the option to just keep your mouth shut. You don't have to embarrass yourself in an interview that's going to be published in a newspaper. You know, part of what I think the problem is, I mean, if we could tie together this silly Alito interview with the Thomas scandal and all the other news that's going on with the Supreme Court, judges are supposed to operate, you know, not just, you know, be completely ethical and above board, but they're supposed to avoid what's called in the appearance of impropriety. And, and the reason for that is because judges aren't elected. They don't have a mandate from the people. The only legitimacy that they have comes from a sense that they are fair, objective, neutral, and they apply the law. And when they damage that impression, either by giving a stupid interview to the, Was to the Wall Street Journal or by going off and, you know, doing whatever Clarence Thomas is doing with his billionaire benefactor, you know, that doesn't just make them look foolish. It diminishes the reason why we trust the court. It diminishes is the reason why we give the court power in the first place. Because if we can't trust them to be objective and neutral and follow the law and not do corrupt things, then they shouldn't have power. Well, it's also very revealing uh, in, in terms of his attitudes towards some of the very cases that are before the court. The fact that he can't be bothered to figure out how to pronounce mifepristone suggests right. someone who's quite cavalier with rulings that affect people all over this country and their bodily autonomy. I, I, I also found that shocking and that these rulings themselves are a nuisance to him. Yeah, I mean, I, I started off by saying that Alito is in the wrong line of work, and I really mean that. I mean, I've covered Alito now for 12 or 13 years. He is the most reliable partisan on the court. He's never found an argument seeking to repeal the Affordable Care Act that he wouldn't vote in favor of. He's never found a restriction on abortion that he wouldn't vote in favor of. He was the you know, one of two justices in this Miffy Prestone case, and the only one who wrote a dissent. He was two. There were two who noted their dissent. He was the only one who wrote one. Just in case after case after case, he just does the partisan thing. And, you know, if you're a senator, that's a fine thing to do. You know, there are plenty of jobs that you can have in, in federal politics where you get to be a partisan. Most jobs in federal politics, you get to be a partisan. The one job you can't do that is judge. And he is a judge. And uh, again, I, I think he needs to understand what his role is supposed to be. I will say, we don't have the time to talk about it here, but he also has a theory that the leak of the Dobbs opinion came as a result <laughs> of effectively the liberal justices on the court who did not want the, Do the ruling to become the decision of the court. We'll have to talk about that at another time, Ian. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you, Alex.